Good morning. <clears throat> God the Mother, a pathway to the non-dual reality. I'd like to start by just introducing who I am. I'm a sannyasini of the Ramakrishna Order of India, a lineage that was established formally in the 8th century common era by the seer philosopher Shankara. And it was the non-dual Advaita Vedanta school of philosophy and spirituality. Ramakrishna was a great Hindu mystic. He lived from 1836 to 1886. He was a priest in a temple just outside of Kolkata at Dakshineshwar. And his uniqueness was he practiced various conflicting sects within Hinduism. The followers of Krishna, of Rama, of Shiva, the Divine Mother, all to their culmination. He went on to receive initiation into the Shankara order and attained Nirvikalpa Samadhi within three days and then went on to live in that state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi for six months, forced fed by a wandering monk who understood the state he was in. This is unparalleled in the history of the world religions. And then he went on to practice Islam to its culmination. He received the vision of Christ. He understood the subtle practices of Buddhism and he honored the Jain and Sikh teachers. Sri Ramakrishna was able to verify from his own experience the great Vedic dictum, ekam sadvipra bahuda vedanti. Truth is one, sages call it by various names. And his profound corollary to that, as many people, so many paths. In other words, all forms of God, all aspects of the divine, all paths, whether dualistic, qualified non-dualistic, or non-dualistic, lead to the ultimate reality. In our tradition, we call it Sat Chit Ananda, exist, existence, consciousness, bliss absolute. So what is the divine feminine's relationship to non-dualism? Swami Vivekananda, the foremost disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who spoke at the first World Parliament of Religions in 1893 in this country, he said, God the Mother is the first and highest manifestation of the Absolute, next the Christs and Buddhas. Well, why and how is this possible? In the Rig Veda, the oldest of the four Vedas, which are the oldest living scriptures of the world, the goddess emerges as powerful and without consort. She is called Vak, the word. We find in her first person utterances that are rare in the Rig Veda. She says, I spread the heavens over the earth. I am the energy of Brahman. I am the mother of all. It is for me that Brahman resides in all intellects, and it is I who have penetrated all the worlds with my power, and am holding them in their places. Again, apart from this, I remain always the all-intelligent, primal energy, as well as the one intelligent being, perfect and untouched by my magic creation. So we see in the Vedanta Hindu tradition, this motherhood of God is a vast, all-embracing reality. Our Vedanta paradigm of reality is twofold. Brahman, the one undivided reality, is called Satchidananda. And Maya, the divine feminine, is the veiling power which superimposes the dream world appearance upon the reality of Brahman, pure consciousness. 
So we have the power of the divine feminine who veils Brahman and projects a dreamlike impermanent reality. And when the divine mother breaks this dream, the supreme reality is revealed. So to the non-dualist Adoita Vedantan, mother holds the key. The second paradigm is Brahman, which is likened to fire, which is one of the most ancient symbols of Brahman. And the divine feminine, which we call Shakti, is its power to burn, the creative force. The two are inseparable, Brahman and Shakti, fire and its power to burn. We cannot imagine fire without burning, and there is no burning without fire. All images of the goddess reflect a particular manifestation of power and are windows into the non-dual reality. Our religion is non-dual. Each aspect of the divine is a symbol, a window into the non-dual. Mother Kali, she severs the head of ignorance, the ego she holds in one hand, dispels fear with another, and grants boons with yet another to those who take refuge in her. And she stands on the inert principle of Lord Shiva and articulates and ushers in the universe. Sri Ramakrishna worshipped Mother Kali in the Dakshineshwar temple. How does his first vision of Mother Kali match Swami Vivekananda's claim of Mother as the first and highest manifestation of the Absolute? After his first vision, he revealed, I felt undiluted bliss and the immediate presence of the Divine Mother. The room, doors, temple, everything vanished, and I saw an infinite, shoreless ocean of light. That ocean was consciousness. However far and in whatever direction I looked, he said, I saw shining waves, one after another, coming towards me to swallow me up. Later, he said, I scarcely realized the presence of people around me. They looked more like shadows or painted pictures than real objects. So this description of the formless aspect of God the Mother is the borderline between the realm of the relative world and the absolute. What about the experience of the divine feminine then in a, a living example? For example, Sita, the consort of Rama, Radha, the consort of Krishna, Mother Mary, Sarada Devi, the virgin wife, of Sri Ramakrishna, who lived from 1853 to 1920 and is recognized as an emblem of the Divine Mother and of Vedanta. Sarada Devi was Sri Ramakrishna's first disciple, and she was the recipient of his teachings and his grace. She attained Nirvikalpa Samadhi and her own non-dual experience informed her motherhood and how it manifest. She experienced the same shoreless ocean of light, pure consciousness, as Sri Ramakrishna. The finite mind dissolving into the cosmic mind and the wave of the higher self immersed in the ocean of Brahman. As one with this shoreless ocean of Brahman, Sarada Devi recognized waves as individual beings that had birth and existence within her as her children. In the Deva Mahatmyam, 
in this 11th chapter, verse 33, an ancient scripture to the Divine Mother. It is said, O Queen of the Universe, you protect the universe as the self of the universe. You support the universe. Those who surrender to you become the refuge of the universe. This impersonal vision is a source and was a source of her loving relationship with all, whoever and whatever that exists. No matter who visited Sarada Devi in Kolkata or in Jairambati, her village just outside of Kolkata, rich or poor, saint or sinner, educated or not, Hindu or non-Hindu, all felt she was their mother, and she recognized all as her children. She fed, nurtured, counseled, and protected them. And that is how her non-dual vision of oneness broke rigid orthodoxies and cast barriers and quietly became precedents in Hindu society today. It is also how her non-dual vision elevated work to the level of worship. In her simple village thatched hut, she performed the most menial house, housework and service as an act of worship that elevated all who witnessed it or received it. For contemporary men and women in our tradition, Sarada Devi's example shows us how any work can transform us and any workplace can become our spiritual arena. Sarada Devi's non-dual experience informed her attitude toward all creatures. A village cat used to lay quietly at her feet and one day when an attendant mistreated it, she instructed that rice be specially prepared for it and its family, saying, don't mistreat the cats. Even in them am I, speaking from the non-dual plane of consciousness. The same consciousness she saw even in inanimate objects. One day an attendant was sweeping her room and when finished, threw the broom to one side. And she said, what? Should you neglect something because it is small? Whatever you care for will take care of you. Whatever regard a thing deserves, that must be accorded to it. Even the broom must be treated respectfully. Sarada Devi's, she manifested non-dualism, Sachit Ananda, through the idea, I of her unconditional love. As one great Swami of our order, a disciple of one of the direct disciples of Ramakrishna stated, this chit of Satchitananda is loving consciousness. Not just consciousness, but loving consciousness. A seer who has that experience sees light, and that light is loving consciousness. That experience gave Sarada Devi the eye of equality and equanimity that we see in her life and her teachings. And before she passed away, she instructed a devotee with these immortal words, my child, I tell you one thing, if you want peace of mind, do not find fault with others. Rather see your own faults Learn to make the whole world your own. No one is a stranger, my child. The whole world is your own. Thank you. So I'd like to ask if any of the other panelists have any questions. Um, for Prabhupada Jika? Well, I, I was struck um, 
struck very much by uh, so many of the, the names, the terms, the stories are foreign to me that you shared with us. But there is a kind of music in the story itself and in the terminology um, that resonates. Mm. And I, I wonder for you were, you, were you steeped in, were you raised in as a child these stories? Did you come to them later in life? How, how did you hear the music of this tradition? I was raised Christian. Mm. And um, my parents broke away from the church when I was 12 years old. And by the time I was in college, I was agnostic. And uh, my father died. And so I suffered a great depression, wondering if, if God is real, if religion is true. And uh, it was through a comparative religions course at a private college in Los Angeles. Uh, we were reading the uh, Houston Smith's book, The Religions of Man and went to the Vedanta temple. And when I walked into the temple in Hollywood, I saw this little man <laughs> seated on the shrine dais, and I knew he was a man of God, and that religion was true. So I came in, in my 20s. Yeah. But it took many years of practice before I felt completely imbued in the mythic universe of the Vedanta Hindu tradition. Beautiful. Um, I guess one reflection I have is just that I appreciated your acknowledgement of the validity of so many different paths. Um, in the Native American world, uh, in California, what we now know as California alone, there were 82 languages spoken. Um, we have many, 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 many creation stories, hundreds of them, thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands. And when you live in a multinational uh, uh, context of so many languages and cultures and, and creation stories, we came to the conclusion that every single creation story was true. Um, we did not need to uh, validate one over, over another. Um, and that's what our, our wise ones told us, that they are all true. Um, and so I really appreciated that, uh, how you opened up with that. So thank you.